All right. Class number two from Hebrews 11. I'm going to um, move a little bit further. If you were a part of the last class, which I think you all were, I mainly taught on faith, its life, its conduct, what it likes to do. I hope you'll spend more time reviewing those things more. Now, Hebrews 11, because of time, I can't teach it verse by verse, so I have to give you an overview. But if you read through it, it mainly talks about Abraham in detail and Moses in detail, and it lists other great people of faith and what they did by name or by a half a verse or by a verse. So we have a list, and the list is obviously incomplete. We got Noah here. We got Cain and Abel's story. We got Enoch. We got Abraham and Sarah. We got Moses. We've got Joshua. We got Rahab the harlot that ended up being a part of the Lord's genealogy. <laughs> Love it. Uh, you know, God has a sense of humor. Rahab's right in the middle of all these holy people. Hallelujah. And it lists Samson and Gideon and David. And it lists all of them, but it doesn't go into details. But it does go into detail about Abraham and Moses. I want to spend the next little time focusing on Moses in this chapter. For me, when I was studying, this came alive to me, so I want to teach you what's alive. Now, I want to encourage you to go through and read the stories about Abraham and all the others, but I want to focus here on Moses. Moses was a very great leader. In John chapter 1, verse 17, it says that by Moses the law came, but by Jesus Christ, grace and truth came. It didn't say Moses was a bad man. Moses did what he was supposed to do in the time that he was alive. He was one of the great leaders of the old covenant. And it starts here in chapter 11, verse 23. Let's read it together, if you would. Verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a good or proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment, which was to really just turn the baby in so it might be killed because the Pharaoh was out killing all the Jewish babies. And so we have here a story about what I would say the birth and the life of a great minister of faith. Moses is an example of some of the things that we must go through as we become great leaders in the body of Christ. There are thousands, if not millions, of average body of Christ, mediocre leaders. Your nation and mine is full of it, of people having just enough Christian knowledge to be religious and disgusting, where you talk to them, you want to, it's terrible, because they just have a religious spirit and just enough to be miserable. I want enough of God to be happy and to have victory. How about you? I don't want to be like, well, I got to live right and I got to do this and then this is what I do as a Christian. I really want to do what you're doing as a sinner. No, that's not me. That's called a miserable person. And we can't be miserable Christians. We can't be miserable Christian leaders or you're going to produce after your kind miserable little sheep. Many might be producing little goats instead of sheep with that kind of spirit. By faith, it says here that Moses' parents saw that he was a proper child. There was something about him that God had a hand on him, wanting to do something like you. And they weren't scared of the king's commandment. They were able to find a way to say, we're not going to let that mean murdering spirit kill Moses, this special proper child. And so they did something different, and they did that by faith. Moses' parents, by faith, Save the little baby's life. Sometimes you've got to use your faith to cover your child's life as they go through different storms and different issues in their own private life. It says in verse 24, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called Pharaoh's daughter. Now there's about 10 words here that I want to highlight as we read these verses that speak to different times and seasons in the life of a minister. It says here in verse 24, that when Moses was come to years, when he come to understanding, the age of accountability to adulthood, he refused something. Ministry starts with refusing before there is an accepting. 
in the life of Moses, he refused to be called Pharaoh's son or the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused something. There may be plans already for you. There may be plans that your parents have made, your society has picked for you, and you have to refuse it. Sometimes the beginning of the great walk of faith is, I'm not going to go the path that everybody wants me to go. It may be a good path. Other folks, that might be the, the will of God for them, but sometimes it's not for you. And you have to learn how to say no and not feel guilty. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I may be brought up in your house. I might have access to the royal table and know all the important people in Egypt. But down deep inside of me, I am a Jew. I belong among the Israelis. I belong among the people of God. Your talent may take your places. Skill may take you places. But when those places, they'll call you one of them. But down deep, you know that you are what you are because God gave you that ability. God gave you that intelligence. God gave that to you. And you cannot just sit there and go, well, I'm glad I'm a product of this school. I'm a product of this generation in, in the Netherlands. No, you're a product of God. Refusing the title and the labeling and the positioning, the positioning of man over your life. You are who you are in Christ. You will do what you do for the call of God. And you cannot let people label you. Let God label you. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I am a Christian. I am a spirit-filled, tongue-talking Christian. I believe in divine healing. I believe in casting out devils. I believe in evangelism, church planning, the coming of the Lord. I am a New Testament Christian and I love it I refuse the label and the positioning of the world I choose to be with God and my people all right verse 25 choosing rather to suffer the afflictions of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season all right the next word of importance that comes to us if we obey the call of God is choosing to be among the hardships or the sidelining of God's people than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. All right, let me talk about that. When you have a refusing, there must come a choosing. They almost go hand in hand. You refuse and you choose. If you refuse and just sit there, then you have no power. There's a choosing and a refusing that starts out in life and ministry. I refuse, but I choose. Moses chose, he said, choose, choosing rather to suffer the afflictions with the people of God, all right? We all have to decide that I'm going to be a Christian, a spirit-filled Christian, speak in tongues out loud Christian, I'm going to be a Holy Ghost miracle believing Christian. And with that, I choose that. And there is going to be a reaction to that. Not everybody's going to like you because you believe in being born again. You believe in speaking with tongues. You believe in the gifts of the spirit. You believe in healing, deliverance, prosperity, righteousness, angels, visions, and dreams. All the wonderful things are in the Bible. They think, oh, you're just too much. And they begin to persecute you and come against you. But we choose. I'd rather be among the people that believe these things than live among folks that bless me with their natural riches and lose everything in the end. I refuse the placement of the world and I refuse to let the persecution from what I have chosen to be into who I'm going to be with to cause me to shrink, lower my voice, or stop my commanding work. I want every person in Holland to be that kind of Christian. You refuse and you choose. Now, it says in this verse, he says, he chose to suffer the afflictions of the people of God more than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The pleasures of sin for a season. How long is the season, I always get asked. 
Here's my answer. Please judge it and see what you think about it. The pleasure of sin is long enough to get you addicted to that sin to where you cannot walk away from it of your own free will. When you're tied and controlled and addicted to something, that's when the pleasure ends and the pain and the suffering of that sin starts. So that pleasure season may be six days, six months. It might take some people a few years, but it'll come. Sin will always entice you with pleasures. And then when it's got you, it turns in that moment into suffering. And Moses said, I choose rather to suffer the afflictions of the gospel with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He already knew. These pleasures may last a year, five years, but it's going to turn. I am a man that belongs among the oppressed people of Egypt, the Jewish people, and I choose to be among them. Then over here in the pleasures of the palace and the pleasures of Egypt and the pleasures of that cultural time, where are you at? Are you at a place where it's time for you to choose to suffer the opposition, the the laughing or people not being your friend because you believe in a born-again experience? Are you willing to suffer with the spirit-filled, tongue-talking people? Divine healing, miracle people? Are you willing to suffer the persecution and the mocking and the cutting off sometimes of friends and opportunities in a nation? Because you believe in deliverance? You believe that God wants to prosper and help you financially? You believe that God still speaks today? The nine gifts of the Spirit are still working today? I choose to be among this people, and I do not mind the persecution or the oppositions or what may be taken from me because I believe that I count it greater honor to be among this family of Spirit-filled people than to be among the dead evangelicals or the religious spirits of the day that don't believe in anything. I'd rather be among the happy Happy, rejoicing, receiving, believing people. And let that rise in your nation. You be that kind of person and don't be afraid. We live by faith. We, refru we refuse and we choose. I choose. I choose to be among the spirit-filled people, the apostolic church planning people that is rising around the earth. I choose that. All that goes with it. And I wear their persecutions as medals on my chest. Hope you do the same thing. Let me tell you a story. The Salvation Army was a great revival movement in the middle to late 1800s. The Salvation Army is probably very much alive like in your country as it is in mine, especially here in America at Christmas time. There are the bell ringers outside, ding, 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 with the little red buckets, and they collect money for the poor to help them at Christmas time. And it's a good ministry, good folks. But the Salvation Army in the beginning was a revival militant people. That's why they were called the Salvation Army. Mm. And so they would get beat up sometimes because they'd go through the streets of London and play the trombones and the bands and preach on the streets and get people saved or come to church and folks would get mad and the devil would rise up and people and beat them up. One day, General Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, was up speaking and and he noticed that some of his soldiers, as he called them, some of the church members, as we would call them, came in and they had been, you know, roughed up. And he stopped his sermon and he called them to the platform and he said, let's look at their medals today. This lady here, her hat had been torn off, her flower and her, thing, her, her, her dress had been torn off, her buttons had been broken. What great medals you have, Mr. Booth told her. And, he, she kind of smiled and got happy because she thought she was defeated because she'd been beat up and it didn't look like she'd won. The next was a little boy who had been hit and kicked and roughed up, mud all over his clothes and bleeding a little bit from his nose and said, what great medals you have. And he described each one of them and the little soldier boy, said, yes, I, I, I did it for Jesus. I endured it for Jesus. What I'm trying to illustrate, he went through about 10 people on that stage. Each thing that happened to them, he called it a medal. We have to be willing to, when we go through persecution to make it a positive that strengthens us, encourages us to be louder and stronger and do more of it 
even in the face of opposition, no matter how bad it is. We refuse and we choose a conscious choice of our person. I, brother, being with the persecuted Salvation Army than out there with the folks drinking in the clubs or having a cup of coffee on the little cafe. I'd rather be with the people of God. I'd rather be with the divine healing preachers. I'd rather be with the prosperity preachers. I'd rather be with the deliverance preachers. I'd rather be with the apostolic church builders. I want to be with these people even if I lose certain degrees of, of opportunity. But God said what we lose for his sake He'll make it come back around, Mark 10, in our life. So whatever you give up as a Christian, God makes it come back somewhere in your life. So hallelujah. All right. I get to preaching and my time's going to be gone. This is Hebrews 11. We're studying at this verses in the life of Moses. Verse 26. Esteeming the approach of Christ as greater riches than all that were in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now, let me talk, because it kind of goes real easy with what I just spoke about. Esteeming the reproach of Christ as gr greater, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he had respect to that reward. Now, esteeming. There is a choice we have to keep making. And I'm going to reiterate this again. We are spirit-filled people. That means we are born again. We have been filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't just have the witness of the Spirit. We are filled to overflowing and come up out of us empowerment and other tongues. Tongues. I esteem that and the benefit of that than all the money in the world. I esteem to be around those who pray by faith for healing and deliverance and look to God for breakthrough and help and the earth is contrary. I esteem that greater than the riches of Egypt. Why is it that he chose the term the riches of Egypt? He could have said the glory of Egypt, the majesty of Egypt, but the riches of Egypt. Because in ministry life, the money thing is a big deal. Most Christians are poor because they don't know that God wants them to have enough to pay their bills on time and to live a comfortable, good life and to be a blessing to others. They call that heresy. But he said, he esteemed the reproaches greater than the riches of Egypt. Because money is an issue. Somehow we think if we're going to be in ministry, we're going to have to be broke. No, you don't have to be broke. But you're not going to live on the, 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 the riches of Egypt. You're going to live by faith that God supplies your need according to his riches and glory and favors you and gives you money and gives you things supernaturally. We have chosen to walk by faith and to receive by faith. And we esteem this life and the benefits of it greater than all the riches of Egypt that he could have had by just being a part of the royal family. But he said no. He had respect unto the reward that comes to him. The earthly rewards that are few that come and the heavenly eternal rewards that are many and mighty that come on that day. What you're known for in eternity is how you're known for forever. I don't mind me calling a fool on this planet, a man that wasted his talent and his life because I know one day when I get to heaven, I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want you to receive the same thing. Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ, greater riches than all the treasures of the pagan land of Egypt. For Moses had respect up to the recompense of reward. God will reward you. God will honor you. He will take care of you. But I don't live in comparing myself with others. I obey my life, my call. God supplies my need, the need of my life, the need of my ministry. And I'm happy. I'm happy. No competition in ministry. No personal fight with one another. Let's encourage one another. Be inspired by each other. But you're not my competitor. You're my co-laborer together in the cause of Christ. And we shall win the Netherlands and Europe 
and America for Jesus. Amen. He had respect under the recompense of the reward. The reward. Verse 27. Are you enjoying this? We're just reading with this part of this great chapter of Hebrews 11. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing he who is invisible. There's your whole teaching by itself. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing. When you live the life of faith and you're going to be a great apostolic leader and be a part of an apostolic church, you've got to remove fear's voice, fear's presence, because it paralyzes you. When fear hits you, it paralyzes you. I pray for you right now that the spirit of fear will be exposed to your conscience and to your spirit where you'll know how to resist it and close the door to it and open your heart to the spirit of faith. You cannot be afraid. You cannot be a great leader. You cannot be in the hall of faith here and have fear guide you, fear direct you. Fear is an enemy. And anytime fear speaks or throws his presence upon you, you should have an automatic reaction to punching it and coming back at it in Jesus' name. Apply spiritual pressure upon the devil by using the name of Jesus with the voice of authority. In Jesus' name, go from me. I break your power. I command you to leave me. Get out of this house. Move from this house. Move from this auditorium. Learn how to apply spiritual force against the spirits of the devil and break them. Most people want to hide in the corner of the church and hope the devil will pass them by. I want to be in the middle of the church on the main altar and let the devil come and let's fight him. And here's how you fight the spirit. You have to learn, maybe I'll have to come back and teach us sometime, how to put pressure in the spirit against the devil. How to apply the resistance that the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resistance starts with, no, I will not take that. No, I will not allow that. No, 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 no. You got to say it like Churchill. No. <laughs> oh, how did I feel good today? You got to learn how to make resistance and the pressure. No, you can't do that to me in Jesus' name. I command this spirit of debt to get out of my house. Oh, no, you don't. You will not come here and live. He has made me prosperous. The blessing of the Lord maketh me rich and adds no sorrow. No poverty. You can't do that. The blessing of the Lord maketh me rich and adds no sorrow. My blessings come as long as there is seed, time, and harvest. As long as there is sun and moon in the seasons, there will be seed, time, and harvest. I planted seeds. No, I'll not accept poverty. That's beginning to apply pressure. Not fearing the wrath of the king. Not fearing the wrath of the principality. Not fearing the wrath of people that cooperate with the devil. Not fearing it. See, prayer is not just always receiving from God. Prayer is a battlefield where you with God's mighty weapons and his name and the angels, you apply pressure against darkness and strongholds and you begin to resist in Jesus' name, in English and in tongues, quoting Bible verses, and you keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing in Jesus' name. No, go, no, we bind you. And you push and you push and you break the back of that spirit's dominion and you take charge in Jesus' name. See, when you're a leader, an apostolic leader in Holland, the Netherlands, anywhere in the world, you have to know how to personally apply pressure back and fight and teach your whole congregation how to do it. You can rejoice in worship, but can you fight together and push pressure on the Prince of Potter that's trying to shrink your church or divide your church or shut it down or not allow the money to come that you've sown for that belongs to you? Oh, make the devil mad that you're raising the people. An apostle ought to be the knows how to fight the devil and not be afraid of the spirit of fear that comes when you fight kings and principalities. He by faith forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. When you're a leader in the kingdom of God, there's an endurance. 
Let me talk about endurance. Endurance is not done like, oh, I'm hanging on until I get to the other side. Can't wait for this to be over. No, that's not endurance. That's a bunch of crap. Stop that. This is not endurance. Endurance has a joy to it. It's a spiritual thing. We endure like Jesus did on the cross. He endured the cross with joy, the Bible says. With joy, the Bible says. Spiritual endurance is, there's pressure, there's weight. You understand in the natural what's going on, but you are enduring with joy. You're worshiping God. You're thanking God for victory when it looks like you're losing. You're worshiping God, speaking in tongues and singing praises and dancing before the Lord, applying pressure, keeping all the spiritual laws active and activated. Oh, you keep it going. You endure with joy. Hallelujah. You keep going. People think you're nuts. Usually in these circumstances, people are sad, seeking counseling and taking medication to keep them to go to sleep and medication to wake them up and they go back to sleep and they're on pills and pretty soon they're addicted to prescription drugs. <laughs> they don't even know what to do. We have to be spirit-filled soldiers of the cross, building apostolic churches for the Holy Ghost and then we invade the nations and we take them and we start the battle. We don't have to wait for it to start. We can go start it, but you've got to build the troops. How to endure in the midst of battle. When you feel tired, and you feel like giving up, you confess the word of God out loud, strong with a strong voice. You worship God out loud with a loud voice and worship God. In the presence of your enemies, you do that. It's what you do. Call together the saints of God not to cry. <laughs> you get together and you do it together. He endured he endured. He endured. Are you going to endure too? By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. You see the end result and you keep going. You see the end result by the eye of faith and you don't give up. In the times that it looks like you're not going to win, God is going to come through. He's the God of the breakthrough. Psalms 46.1 He's your present help in the time of trouble. My friend, present help in the time of trouble. All right. Are you enjoying this? Is this helping you? It's making me feel real good. I, I wish we had like five weeks just to teach this chapter. Let me go on and, and, and teach some more of Moses' life. Verse 28. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. All right? Through faith, he kept the Passover. Now, there are some things, when you become successful, people try to talk you out of what made you successful. Moses kept the Passover, something they celebrate, a holy feast, a holy time. When you come into your place of governance, your place of where God's planted you to rule and reign his kingdom and direct the, the spiritual troops of the territory you're in, what do you keep? When you become successful, what do you keep? All of a sudden, many a person don't keep what brought them their success. And then thus they have a, a form of godliness, but no power. Because they didn't keep what made them powerful and made them successful at that point. Some people, they no longer preach faith. They preach hope. They no longer keep holding to the scriptures that brought them financial success of seed time and harvest and Sowing and reaping. That's why that building out there that you're in is paid for. That's why your home is paid for. That's why all these missionaries have been sent and all these kids have gone through school and you paid for it because you believed in the law of seed time and harvest. And now that you're famous and got some success and you're being welcomed among groups that used to hate you, are you going to keep the principles that made you that way? Oh, Brother Roberts, I don't want to make them mad. Make them mad. They tortured you for 10 years. 
I challenge you and I challenge you the future that you remember this word and these words tonight. Keep that which made you great alive and active in your life. How did you pray in the beginning with your church? What kind of prayer meetings were there? Like, I'll almost guarantee you, you got together and you prayed like the house was on fire. You prayed strong, you prayed loud, you prayed aggressive, you prayed warfare prayers, you prayed prophetic prayers, you did prophetic demonstrations, you did all kinds of things, and you got the pressure, you got the breakthrough, and you got it. And now that you have it, are you going to keep the Passover that made you get it? I'm sad to say that my experience in 127 countries, an observation that I have, is that most of the time what made people great when they come to the greatness of people's respect for what they've done, they back down from the tenacity, they back down from the boldness, they back down from the authority, they back down from preaching adamantly and dogmatically the revelations that brought them their success because they don't want to offend anybody. My friends, endure and keep. Keep the spirit-filled prayer times. Keep deliverance. I remember years ago when I had my Bible school in Southern California, we had the first week of Bible school was called clean out week. And what it was, was it's the first day of school. They came and signed in, paid their tuition, all the stuff, and we start. And we did five hours a day of nonstop prayer and praise, mainly prayer and not as much singing. And we made them pray in tongues, prayed in English, pray the word, and just go at it for five hours a day. For the first week, five hours a day. My attitude was this, if they can survive the first week, they'll survive the year. And in that prayer time, we'd have deliverances because you start praying for three or five hours a day for five days a week, stuff on you will stop coming out, stuff in you will stop coming out and, and you'll start getting the need for deliverance. And we'd have deliver about Wednesday mid-morning. All of a sudden, you start hearing people, <coughs> they start coughing and making noises. And I thought, hmm, the devils are coming out. Their stronghold is being broken. And we just keep praying and all of a sudden it is like, bam, it hit the room and you'd have like 15, 20 people manifest all at the same time. <laughs> and we just, I said, sing all the high praises and the blood songs, you know, sing warfare songs, conquering songs. I take my mic off, take the teachers and some of the other ministers that would come in to help. I said, let's go out and Cast out devils. And brother, we had fun for a day and a half. We started casting out devils right and left, and all of a sudden, others would start manifesting. It was great. And then we'd pray for everybody before it's all over. We'd pray for everybody and bind up the devils and help them pray and how to resist the devil. And then come back like Thursday mid-morning. They're like, oh, Lord. And we keep praying in tongues five hours, nonstop. 8.30, start. No music, just raw. Pray. I thought, Brother Roberts, we can't. And some would leave. We'd have, every year we'd have, you know, 10, 15 people leave. We can't do this. Fine. Then goes to another Bible school. This is how we train. We train you for the high places of the field that we can go and fight the powers and win. I'm not training you to live in the sound of chapel bells. I'm training you to build a mission church next to the gate of hell. And then on Friday, they'd all come back so energized it was it's one of those it was supernatural they had finally got deliverance and freedom and breakthrough and so friday we'd pray for the first hour and they would just start jumping and hooping and shouting and i'd say now I'll just take the next two hours or so praise team and just worship god with high praise and worship and just have fun and go for it and they just take off dancing and singing and shouting and then worshiping and crying and We'd end up in our first week like that, and that's how we started Bible school. To this day, when you ask any of my Spirit Life Bible College students, they go, what's your favorite time in Bible school? It wasn't when Oral Roberts came, even though that was great. It wasn't when we had Norval Hayes or we had, you know, all the speakers and we did the field trip. All that was fun. They'll always tell you, and I found it so funny. We love clean-out week. 
We like to go to clean out week. We love clean out week. You know, maybe you all should do that too. And I know they're halfway through the, they're out of breath. They have no endurance because they have a wimpy spirit. By the time they finish the first week, they got a taste of that glory divine and they want more and their hunger. And the devils left them and they came back. They got beat up and they stayed free. We love training Bible school students, but you got to get it going right. I keep that. I learned that from my mother, my grandmother. I learned that from Norval Hayes and Lester Summer. I learned deliverance and strong prayer. I keep it. Some of the preachers that would come to preach in my camp meeting, they liked me, but they also made fun of me in a, in a, in a nice way, but they made fun. They go, I remember one guy, it was Tim Story, good man, got a great church down in California. He goes, I can always spark one of your students. He called him Laird and I. I can spark a Laird and I. My name's Robert Laird, and so my followers in his mind were called Laird and Knights. We can always spot a letter tonight because they've lost their voice. So what do you mean? He goes, they've all been yelling and screaming in prayer for hours. And they don't have a voice left. And I, and I first thought, well, that's embarrassing. But I thought, no, I know what they're doing. They had to find their voice of authority. And normally when a person finds a voice of authority, they go through seasons of just natural yelling in prayer. Oh, God, come, come. There's not authority, but that's how they find it. And we would encourage them and push them and push them until they came into the authority. And sometimes they lived in the screaming for a while and I was able to endure their screaming and their little excessiveness of things like that while they were finding that voice of authority that God gave them in their spirit. I kept it. It was made fun of. People talked about it. And I looked at it as an honor. I kept the Passover. I kept what made our world work alive. And I didn't be become ashamed of it. He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood lest he, would, he that would destroy the firstborn should touch them. And the last one here, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as on dry ground, and the Egyptians were assailed or drowned behind them. Faith gets the answer. Faith gets the breakthrough. Moses did all of that and crossed the Red Sea. By faith they passed pass through to victory and you will pass through to victory too we're not going to live in defeat we're not going to be in survival mode we're going to thrive and we're going to fight we're going to build and we're going to win hebrews 11 let me read this verse to you again these verses from the life of moses the principles of apostolic successful ministry verse 23 by faith moses when he was born was hid for three months by his parents because they saw that he was a proper child. They were not afraid of the king's commandment. And by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, when he became an adult, a young man, he refused the title of the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused a royal title. He chose rather to be among the people of God and to suffer their affliction. And he counted it more honorable than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the approach of Christ, greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. He had respect to that great reward. By faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. He endured all those things. Because he saw that which was invisible. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest the destroyer would come and touch them, but it passed them by. Verse 29, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, and the Egyptians were drowned in the sea behind them. This to me is one of the great stories 
of all times. And in Hebrews 11, we get the detail. These great words that we must live by and we endure these seasons. What are those words? Refuse and choosing. Esteeming and respecting. Forsaking, not fearing, enduring, keeping, and passing through to victory. That's the life of a minister. The life of a believing congregation. I wish we had time. We only got about a minute left here to go and talk about Abraham. But I just felt in my spirit to slow down and to teach you on the life of Moses that he did by faith. I want to encourage you to read the whole chapter here and read about each person that is listed and maybe then go back and read their complete story because most of these are Old Testament references. And read their story in detail and note that they were honored in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. And I want you to be in the Hall of Faith too. This is a great time to be a leader, to be a part of a great congregation. Why sit on the sidelines in boredom and being baptized in prune juice of religion? Why don't you get up and get the new wine of the Spirit and become a Spirit-filled soldier and enjoy the life of victory and fighting the devil and doing things that bless God and irritate darkness? If you're not called to build a church, join one and help push and build that way. This is a great time. This is a great time. This is a great time for all of us to be alive and to live by faith every day. Father, I pray for the students that are listening that you will give to them the wisdom of Moses' choices as they live out their calling in the earth. Let a spirit of a champion come alive in them, of a conquering leader, of a war leader, that will take on the principalities and powers and the human dynamic and by faith in God win. I pray for you to be healed and be healthy. I pray for you to prosper and to continue to abound in all good things. I bind the spirit of the devil off and out of your life. Father, take the wrong people out of their life and let the right people come in that they might be able to do the great battles and the great joys of victory to come to them. I pray for you today for God to bless you in your coming and your going. And may clarity, surety, and an immovable faith be found in you today. I pray that for you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I hope to see you when I'm over there soon. Holland and the Netherlands are one of my most favorite places to go. I want to thank Apostle Shirley and the team for allowing me to teach these two courses or two classes. And I must confess, I didn't get it all done, but I knew it was impossible. Hope you enjoyed it. You guys have a great day. And remember, something good is going to happen to you today.